The winds of magic from the realm that chaos destroyed managed to persist through time and space. Among these was the wind of life, Jiran, whom, before the conclusion of the end times, Alariel had become an incarnate of. Jiran blew through the cosmos, eventually manifesting its energy into a new green growing arboreal realm that matched its nature, and in this realm it coalesced into Alariel once again. But the former Ever Queen was asleep. Sigmar, god of the empire from before the end times and incarnate of the heavens, happened to be awake so when he came upon Alariel in his travels through the cosmos in the aftermath of the devastating apocalypse, he awoke the Ever Queen from her slumber. For a time, Alariel was filled with grief from seemingly being the sole survivor of the catastrophe that had consumed all she had ever loved and known. And for aeons, she walked the verdant halls of Jiran, alone and mournful. But her grief slowly transformed to hope. Realizing she was now in an entire world that was in tune with her essence, she planted a new people for her to love and protect, channeling the winds of Jiran so plentiful in both this realm and herself, sowing the earth around her with soul pods. These seeds grew into beings also filled with Jiran's glory. And together with Alariel, they could truly appreciate the beauty of such a realm, overflowing as it was with life itself, and things that grew, and blossomed, and sprouted. And these were people not just capable of adoring and tending to the forests and glades and wilderness of Jiren, but also a nation fully equipped to defend itself from those who would besmirch these lands with their filthy footsteps, who would dare cut down a tree or start a fire, or pluck a flower. Among the first to grow from the soul pods of Alario seedling groves were the dryads who had returned from the world it was, fresh and eager to slake their aggression on any who dare poach or chop in their domain. Led by their branch wraith leaders, these entities preferred the same hit and run tactics they practiced in the previous world. There were the tree lords who took the shape of tower-sized men clad in bark instead of skin, able to easily flatten fully armored knights with gnarled fists, or use writhing roots and vines extending out from their hands to snake through any crack in armor, piercing the flesh within, or entangling groups of attackers at a time. These tree lords could even take up the sword if they so desired. There were also the tree revenants. These were beings of elf and tree combined into one form. Branch witches would also command swarms of spite to fly at the enemy. There were Karnoth hunters, twice the size of dryads, who were beings of bark that wielded scythes, swords, or great bows in equal measure, whatever the situation required. Arc revenants led hosts of creatures, borne through the air upon wings from symbiotic zephyr spikes upon which they reached vantage points so that they could view the entire battlefield and make appropriate strategic decisions. Alario the Everqueen commanded the love and respect of all these creatures. They were her children, after all. And when she brought them to battle, she would do so on the back of a giant wardroth beetle, which crushes poor fools in its mandibles as Alario weaves her potent gyranic magic, while they both leave trails of blossoming flowers and fruits in their wake. Alariel had allied herself with Sigmar, who commands the Stormcast Eternals, an army of demigod warriors whose souls are forged in eternal trials and endlessly recycled after falling in battle into new bodies, which are clad in the hardest Aetherite armor, who literally strike within bolts of lightning. Alariel and Sigmar, together along with their allies, have pledged to defend the realms of order against chaos. Long have the Wood Elves designated themselves as protectors of the natural world, whose heart rests in Athel Lorin. But how deep is this commitment, really? 
I argue that the Azurai are arbitrarily selective in the parts of nature they consider worth protecting. This may have changed for their Queen Ariel in the years leading up to the end times, but given the conclusion of those transpirings, it was clearly not enough and not in time. The Azurai see themselves as being the only true appreciators of Isha's bounty. They sing trees into architecture rather than cutting them down, this is true. When a deer or rabbit is slaughtered, every part of the body is used for food, tools, and clothing. This is true. The practice, however, only extends to what life they deem worthy. The wild hunts led out of the forest every spring, slaughtering all in their path. Are the hapless Bretonians who fall prey to these needless pogroms not a part of the weave they claim to serve? The Oak of Ages is the heart of all life on Malice, and its roots extend to the far reaches of the world through mountains and under oceans. This includes Bretonia. How are the filthy peasants and arrogant nobles of the Royarchy any less a part of the cycle of life and death than the flora and fauna of Athol Loren? What parts of the peasant body are used for sustenance when he is slaughtered just for plowing the field on the wrong day during the spring? How is this poor creature left to rot any different than the trees the dwarves cut down for kindling or the animals imperial hunters kill for sport? Azrai sympathizers will claim that the wild hunt is necessary to release bloodthirsty emotions which bubble over after winter. That to keep the weave in balance, not only life, but death too, must be maintained and supplicated. To these critics, I would submit the following query. Where were the Azrai when the Skaven, even as their undercities, burrowed and bore into the very heart of the earth? overwhelmed the temple cities of Lustria with their unnatural plagues and endless numbers. Where were the great spirits of the wood when village after village after village disappeared near the edge of the Drakwald, a forest perpetually defiled by hordes of ravenous beastmen? Where were the volleys of wood elf arrows to defend their so-called buffer state when the long ships of Norska come to raid Britannia's northern shores? Are the Azrai afraid of a true challenge? How can the Wood Elves claim to be guardians of the Weave and its heart, which is the Oak of Ages, when its roots are severed, the land corrupted without contest, and the very ground beneath their feet infested with numberless ratmen? Those who claim the Wood Elves haven't the time or the resources for such ventures are selectively forgetting that the wild hunt happens every spring. If there is such an abundance, pent up energy and excess resources for this fey jihad to happen every single year, then let the wild hunt fall upon those who truly befoul and degrade Isha's gifts. If Ariel is able to use the world roots to hop across continents because of personal grief, then the roots should be used to allow the wrath of the Azurai to fall upon any who would threaten the weave's integrity, wherever they may be. Let the wrath of the Azrai fall upon the offensive, repulsive, and ubiquitous Skaven, or the mindlessly brutal Greenskins, or the Beastmen, who would transform every forest in the world into glades of woe if they had the power, not random Bretonian peasants who already worship in ignorance what is an elven goddess. Furthermore, it is insane that a rogue terrorist like Dritcha is able to roam the lands freely slaughtering and pillaging, and eventually kidnapping a fey enchantress, all to resurrect the maddened Coadil. How can they be mad at poachers and woodcutters when they themselves poached a priestess and cut down so many Bretonian lives? These injustices left unrectified are why Lilieth betrayed Ariel, clearly. Centuries of the slaughter of her subjects, and then the blatant theft of her highest priestess without even the slightest disavowal from the consort king or the mage queen. As for the stubborn Dawi, the dwarves will always hold their grudges. But a wise man said you can never control what others do, only what you can. If the dwarves will never forget their past offenses, no matter how many times you have repaid the debt, 
and let them stew in their own hypocrisy. Let their anger become hollow and brittle, their grievances unjustified. Eventually, their dwarven sense of honor might overpower their brittle, crumbling desire for revenge. It is absurd that the one faction with access to such an asset as mass teleportation and a mastery of guerrilla tactics refuses to apply these assets productively, despite the fact that such endeavors would strengthen the weave and have been proven to do so, and by extension, Athel Lorin and the Azrai themselves would be empowered. Ariel had begun to rectify this after falling to such a low and dark place she had no choice. But it was too little, too late. It is a distinction without a difference whether this continuous inaction and these ill-done deeds were due to cowardice, sloth, or conceit. The result was the same for the Ezrai. The destruction of the entire planet, and thus their own demise. 